So when I was getting started, I came from the, uh, grew up in California, in the Bay Area, um, and I was just producing hip hop music back then. So I would make music for anybody who came over to my mom's house. Hey, hey you. Uh, anyone who came over to my mom's house, I had a room in there that we would call the studio, and I would charge them $15 an hour, and I would have a bunch of rappers looking over the back of my shoulder while I made beats, and this is how I figured out how to make uh, beats pretty fast, and pretty soon people want to finish songs, so I learned how to make finished uh, songs pretty fast. So we got a little bit of popularity in the Bay Area. My group was called the Cataracts. You guys remember the, the Cataracts, anybody? It's the Cataracts. Yeah, that was us. So anyway. All right. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So here, that's what I'm here to talk to you about, about how to quickly go from being a guy who just makes beats uh, to making songs. Now, I have no doubt if you guys are here that you're serious. A lot of you are probably very talented. But I've met a lot of talented musicians who don't leave a footprint on the music world, and that's really a fucking tragedy. And I'm going to tell you where I see people go wrong and where I'd like you guys to go right. All right? But first, a little story. So years ago, before I started Kashmir, my group, The Cataracts, we produced pop and hip-hop. I moved to L.A. I found a pool shed with a toilet and a shower the size of a coffin that was advertised as a charming one-bedroom all to yourself. And they said... Uh, uh, you know, this is a good deal. I thought this is a good deal, too, considering that I've been sleeping on the couch for the last three months. It really did seem like a good deal. So living off of borrowed money and free Craigslist furniture, including a piano, I ate a $5 foot-long Subway sandwich back when they really used to be $5, half for lunch and half for dinner. I would just eat a Subway, one Subway sandwich. And aside from that, I was just in the shed. I was making music all day, every day. My managers would send over different artists, I make him a song, and I believed every song we made was a smash hit. I was an idiot, you know, that's just how it was back then. Uh, but I was an idiot that was always at the faucet. I was waiting with a cup in case something smart came out. I was always at the faucet. And then one day they sent in this Asian hip hop group called the Far East Movement, and I didn't know it, but my whole life would change. We made a song called Like a G6. We thought, hey, this is pretty catchy. We polished it up, we got a mix. We got it mastered. We said, here goes nothing. We hit the send button, and boom. You know what happened? You guys know what happened? Jack shit. Nothing happened. I was still a bum. I went from Subway to the shed to, you know, music to the shed to Subway to eat my sandwich. But I kept the faucet running, and I didn't care. I loved it. It went on for this, uh, like this for 18 months until finally somebody got the memo, and Like a G6 went number one in 12 countries, so, uh, but now, nine years later, as I stand before you guys today, I'll tell you a secret, which is that I missed that shed, and everything that meant anything was already in that shed, which brings me to my first rule. Be broke. Be broke for as long as you can. Some of you might already have this one down. <laughs> uh, spend all your time making music, and just live like a bum. See? Bums don't owe anything to anybody. No mortgage, no car payments, no responsibility. Everything that you're responsible for is going to suck your energy. And if you got a dream, you got to know achieving it means giving everything you have. And when you reach a certain age, it's not cute to be broke anymore. You'll have people who depend on you, and doing what it takes to achieve your dream will mean letting them down, and chances are you just won't do it. You might say, well, I want to live a nicer life while I work this music thing out. But then you take on a job that has nothing to do with your dream. And that job takes the time you should be spending on your dream to buy shit you don't really need for your dream. And the money you make ain't nothing compared to the money you make if you achieved your dream. People all around us just give up and they don't even know it. Giving up is subtle. We give up when we choose safety, when we trade our dreams for comfort. So be a bum. All the way to the bank. That's rule number one. Rule number two is use people. Not in a bad way. Still pay people and make sure they're credited and give them royalties. But use people is my rule number two. Another thing about that song, Like a G6, this petal of the eternal wealth flower that fell into my lap, it was a fluke. If 
I'd been alone that day, it never would have happened. My fingers slipped. I dragged the MIDI from a pluck to the 808, inadvertently creating the signature bass line of Like a G6. And just as I was going to fix this mistake, I noticed everybody's head bobbing. Like, oh, this is dope. And then suddenly I think, oh, yeah, this is dope. See, that was fluke number one. Fluke number two, the hook, popping bottles in the ice like a G6, was already the bridge from another song that my partner David had written. He suggested reusing it for this song. To be fair, he was probably so stoned, he didn't feel like writing another hook. Uh, so I, I threw it over the beat, and in my head I'm thinking, oh, this is kind of lazy. This auto-tune is out of key. But then I notice everyone's head bobbing again, and so I say, oh, yeah, you know what? This is dope. So most producers were lone wolves, and the ego in me for so many years kept me from appreciating the contributions of the people around me, from recognizing my own limitations. But we make music for people, and if you care about your music touching people, it gets so much easier when you involve people in your process. Feed off of their energy, feed off of their talent, the greatest producers I've met, the ones with godlike longevity, all shared one thing, the power to see the gifts of others, no matter how unconventional, and utilize them. So that's rule number two for being a good producer with longevity. Use people. Be nice to people, but use people. Okay? A wise man once said, if you can't be used, you're useless. Rule number three. <laughs> Rule number three, so fast forward a bit, things started falling apart. My partner David left the group, the cataracts, and I had a choice to continue as this B-level pop producer or start something new. Now, I had this vague idea of Kashmir, that I would do something with my heritage, with my Indian roots, but it was just this idea. That's all it was. No matter how many times I've told people to follow their heart, when it came time for me to decide between sticking with something that seems to work okay, the thing that's made all my money, or taking a leap of faith into something that could be amazing, I almost didn't do it. I was scared. I was terrified. My managers were looking at me like, what do we do now? Are you 100% sure about this cashmere thing? So I sucked it up, and I looked him in the eyes, and I said, yes, also known as a lie. Uh, the thing is, how could I ask these grown men to follow a guy who's only 60 or 70 or even 80% sure? By the time you present your idea to the world, there are only two numbers that matter, zero and a fucking hundred. So are you going to be a zero? No, you're not. Are you going to be 100% sure? Not exactly. Nobody is, but you're going to fake it till you make it like I did. If you have an idea, maybe it's abstract, maybe you don't have all the details, but you have a feeling something is there, just fling yourself at it. Throw yourself at it. Figure out the rest later. Trust me, smart people miss out all the time by mumbling on about the possible consequences, while idiots win just by flinging themselves into things that they barely understand. The beauty of throwing yourself at something is just... <laughs> The beauty of throwing yourself aside is just how often you'll be surprised. I promise you guys. You'll put the pieces together. You'll learn the things you need to along the way. And you'll look back from the top of the mountain saying, damn, all this came from my little brain, from my little ideas. So, ADE, you're here. You threw yourself at it. You're here. You all say you're producers. You threw yourself at it. And you are. So take a big idea. Shut up. Stop thinking about it and just throw yourself at it. That's rule number three. Okay, now we could look at the, uh, yeah, hmm, well, actually I did something kind of fun. I started thinking about, well, you know what, not everyone's like me. I usually get up here and I talk about looking at your heritage and looking at your culture, because that's something that I did as Kashmir uh, but I realized that there's a lot of different paths that people take. So I did this big analysis. And I said, okay, who are some big guys I think are interesting? So Diplo, he's, he's got this. You can read it. I'm not going to bore you with all this stuff. But I wanted to do it for my own. His breakthrough was working with MIA. One important thing about that for you producers out there, I mentioned being a lone wolf. I think it's incredibly important that you start working with vocalists. 
and start producing other people's music quickly. The thing about us is we all think we're so sophisticated and every song we make is going to be genius. But then when you work on somebody else's song, you can quickly come up with a canvas for them. You can come up with a package for them and you can actually fucking finish songs. Because when we're working on songs for ourselves, often we want to put so much in there so that it's this reflection of everything we are. But when you work with another artist, you can come up with a relatively simple vision for them and you could be more effective. So listen, Diplo finally uh, broke through when he was working with MIA. I think Diplo's big thing is that he really pays attention to subcultures and some people criticize him for this, but he makes them popular. He makes them digestible to a mainstream audience. You got DJ Snake. Thing about I love about Snake is he, he's like a hip hop guy. So he approaches dance music from a perspective like, you know, if, if you say, oh, Kashmir is the kind of the Indian meets uh, dance music guy. Well, DJ Snake does that for hip hop. And, uh, I, and I just think that gives him a unique perspective, right? So Kygo, Kygo is great. And I love guys like Kygo. And I think Skrillex is similar where they came up or at least popularized a genre we didn't even know we wanted yet. And he remained number one at it because he is a skilled producer. And that's really, in my opinion, the best case scenario when you carve out a lane that's completely your own and there's no competition for you. Kygo's songs pretty much all sound the same, but they're all equally fucking great because he made his own genre, essentially. Right? And then Marshmallow. Marshmallow is kind of a curious example to me because we can't all put on helmets now, can we? Uh, and we can't all come up with the super cute branding that just connects like wildfire the way that he did. Uh, but it's like an art project meets real life. And originally when I started Kashmir, that was sort of how I looked at it. I didn't want to show my own face. And that can go a long way if you're a fucking dork like I am to not show your face. And like a lot of you are probably. So Skrillex... Uh, he is a lot like Kygo to me in the sense that he will always be remembered at being at the sort of the crest of the wave of his genre. When you think dubstep, you think Skrillex. When you think Tropical House, you think uh, Kygo. Oftentimes, being the first is more important than being uh, the best. If you ever watch the news, there's always a big emphasis on uh, being first. And then the second emphasis on, is on the facts. But you want to be first because people remember first. And uh, that's not a criticism or anything. For the news, that's not a good quality. But for music, being first trumps uh, being the best. You got Tiesto. Tiesto is what? He's just like the guy. We don't even know how he got there. He's just number one, you know. Uh, he's the originator. But what his longevity, I think, can be attributed to the fact that he's always paying attention to the new up-and-comers. He reached out to me when I was working on Secrets, and that became a collaboration. He's always got his ear to young people, and that is what's responsible for his longevity. Uh, and then Timmy Trump, who's a good friend of mine, is just that uh, he made this bold choice to be the craziest motherfucker at every show and uh, raise the bar for EDM performances by incorporating his live trumpet. And I think that was... Uh, I think he's sort of like the new Steve Aoki maybe you could look at. He carved out his own lane that way. So here with a little bit of Photoshop skills that I possess, I, uh, I made this fun little thing. And can you read it okay-ish? Well, poor Kygo, whatever, poor Skrillex. So these are the f sort of four categories that I can see people doing well in. And this isn't just in dance music. This is also uh, just in all genres, I, I think. Yeah, you, you could be, but it, here's the thing. We all might want to be something, but I think in life you start learning a little bit what the universe wants from you. Like me, I might want to be a tastemaker, Diplo, DJ Snake kind of guy, but I was never cool in high school. I really don't like talking to people. Not a big fan of people. So that it's just not a, you know, a lot of this is about relationships and about really paying attention to trends. That's another problem. I don't listen to any new music. I've been listening to the same music that, you know, I have since high school. I don't really qualify for being a tastemaker. Now, being a showman, 
You got guys like Dimitri Vegas, like Mike. You got Timmy Trumpet. They're known for insane live shows, making festival anthems. They evolve with the dance trends. If there's a new trend, you could be fairly sure that they're going to put out a song with the new trend, right? And that's not, a, that's not a shot at them or anything. I mean, listen, we're DJs. We're supposed to play music uh, people want to hear, right? So there's that. And then over here is the inventor. Now, uh, Skrillex and Kai I already talked about. They sort of invented and popularized their genre. They're undeniably skilled producers. I wouldn't consider them traditional socialites. This is my favorite uh, area. And to a smaller extent, I'm not as you know famous as these guys. That's kind of where I would place myself as having invented this sort of sound that I do and carving out my niche there. Now, the last one that I almost don't even want to talk about is uh, Marshmallow and Martin Garrix. You know, these guys started with a core following in the dance scene. Uh, they have this branding that hits critical, Matt. You got Martin Garrick. He's, a, he's a, uh, like the golden retriever of dance music. Um, you, got <laughs> you, you got Marshmallow, who's just incredibly, just a, got a catchy look, right? In terms of look appeal, they're kind of equally amazing, you know, uh, uh, for different reasons. Um, crossover pop hits with huge artists. Now, the reason I don't like mentioning this is that it's kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to aim for. Um, I just think that there's sometimes a spark every you know few years where somebody hits this critical mass, and uh, it's it's obviously amazing. But I think it's too difficult to recreate, and I think you'll end up getting confused if you try to recreate it, and you'll probably end up sacrificing yourself uh, if you try to recreate it, because it's just. Um, it, it's, it's hard for me to follow exactly what the path is, as opposed to an inventor where I could go into some ideas about how you guys could think about what your story is and create out your own area where you might not have a billion followers, but you might have 100,000 or even 10,000, but at least they'll really be your fans and your followers, and you could depend on them. Listen, even when I don't put out big songs, I still have these amazing fans who come out to the shows and I still get to travel the world and I get to play the music that still excites me. So it's a path I can understand and it's the path that I'm going to talk to you guys about today and give you some pointers on. Okay? Was this cool? Did you guys like this? Yeah? Okay. It took me way longer than it should have uh, to make that. Okay, so keys to being an artist. Uh, the first one I already talked about, there's some mega artists with nonstop hits and good looks, and I just don't know how to do that, so I'm not gonna teach that. Uh, the sooner you can stop trying to be someone you're not, the better. You might not be a Skrillex guy, maybe you're more of the Dippo guy. Maybe you're super cool and in a room of people you can make those connections and that's just you naturally and that could be your angle, okay? But create the artist project like you're the hero in this movie. Somebody that you would respect and make decisions based on that. Very early on in your artist project, you're only going to have two or three songs out. And as complicated as you might consider yourself to be, you will be as simple as those three songs to everybody else. So make sure that they're really indicative of the hero that you want to be in this movie. Consider yourself a character. Characters can be fairly simple. Maybe you as a human being aren't, but people will digest you in a simple way, and you need to be cognizant of that. So what is your story? What is a story you could tell? And having something to say in my opinion, is more important than technical skill. And I say G6 here because that song G6, when I listen back to it, it was so fucked up. It had the key, the bass was in the wrong key. All these things I would have changed now, but it was really about that song at that time having a unique flavor that it gave to the world, I think, that made it so successful. So having something to say, a unique idea to say, is more important than technical skill. And I'm going to keep beating that home. I'm just not a big fan of sound designers who do the real technical stuff. I think it's always better to have an idea at the beginning of your song and follow through with that. The third thing is, I don't need to relate to you. This is a common misconception I see when people are writing songs a lot. 
they say, oh, well, this line, will people relate to this? Who cares? I don't want to relate to you. You're probably boring. I want to hear about something new, right? Uh, uh, I don't want to hear about everyday life. I want to hear about what is a special thing about you that you can bottle up that makes you unique. Take the most unique aspect of you and bottle that up and give me something weird. What's the weird side of you? You know, that's what I'm more interested in. That's what makes a better art. If you look at Billie Eilish, I don't think relating to Billie Eilish is her big appeal. She's a fucking weirdo. Okay, so number four, don't look at what's happening in the scene. Look at what's not happening. What's missing that you have? And when I started Kashmir, one thing I noticed, it, times are different now, but everybody had the same uh, haircut. Everybody was on stage with the peace and the love. And, you know, it was Avicii, R.I.P. Avicii, Hardwell. They all kind of had the same uh, plur look. And I just thought it would be nice if something could be sort of the antichrist to all of that and it'd be darker and cinematic. And that's, uh, if you guys are Kashmir fans, some of you maybe remember song Megalodon uh, was the first one where it started out like a regular spinning video, like here are these hot chicks getting on a boat and, uh, and then they all got eaten by a shark, right? <laughs> Big shark came out and that was just fun. I just thought that was so fun. And uh, if you look at the scene and you can find uh, uh, what's not there, you'll probably get a fan base for it. If you can find something that's exciting to you, there's probably other weirdos who will get excited by it also. Uh, you just have to, uh, you know, try to, yeah, offer some weirdness. So you're more likely to succeed being original and pretty good than didn't finish the sentence. What was I going to say? And pretty good than... Uh, 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 Oh, forget it. I didn't finish it. Um, <laughs> more likely to succeed being original and pretty good. Oh, yeah, than, uh, than being really good at uh, probably repeating something that somebody else is doing. Like the thing uh, with Skrillex, right? You can be the best dubstep uh, producer now. It's just not going to cut through the way that it did when Skrillex came out with Bangarang. And a lot of people are better at making that same sound than Skrillex was. It's just he was first, and he'll always be remembered for that. So anyway, these are reasons that I started Kashmir. I wanted it to be cinematic, and later on, I wanted to start pulling more of the Indian influence uh, into it. So applying this to uh, your songs, when you're making a song, I would say don't spend a lot of time at the beginning on any one idea. You got to get good at sussing out what the good ideas are and the bad ideas are. And trust me, I make a lot of bad ideas all the time. I'd say I make 10 bad ideas for every good idea that should come out, and the rest should be thrown away. So what is the essence of your song? Once a good idea emerges, something promising, you've got a little melody and some chords, think about the essence of what you're creating. What instruments are true to this world? What melodies are true of this world? And what does the peak energy of this world sound like? So that's going to be your drop or your chorus. Figure out quickly if it's worth pursuing. Don't worry about the mix down or picking perfect samples. Make a two-minute long layout using your sound palette and create the peak energy section. Create the valleys of it. And once you've sketched your idea, you can assess if it's worth finishing. And if you decide it's not amazing, no problem. You didn't waste a lot of time. Do this early on especially, have lots of little ideas, and then pick which ones you think are worth your time because you don't have infinite time. Does the song represent you? Does it represent something cool to you? That's the next question you got to ask. So you could think about your culture like I do. Think about all the music you've loved and how you can blend that with the modern sound. It's not enough just to take Indian music or just to take old Western music or whatever the combination is, you have to know how to package it with the current sounds of today. Often things are groundbreaking, quote unquote, simply because they combine two existing things that aren't normally linked. When I talked about Snake and hip hop and dance music and Diplo and how much attention he pays to all these cultures and then combines it with dance music, it's looked at as revolutionary, but oftentimes it's just taking two existing things and putting them together. So when you think about your own taste and the music that you've loved, instead of reinventing something genius, 
often it can just be combining two things that no one's ever done before. That can be the genius. Most commonly, that's the genius, okay? People succeed in seeing symmetry where others don't. I always think it's assholes and stupid people who point out the differences in everything. And it's successful, smart people that I admire who point out the overlap and the similarities. And now I'm getting kind of philosophical, but I think as a smart uh, a person who's going to get ahead in life, you should be always looking at the similarities, the similarities between people. Uh, I'm going to use this case. When I was starting out ghost producing, uh, I worked on the song Tsunami. You guys remember that one? Boom. Da, 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 da. Now, when I was working on this song, the vision for it was seeing the symmetry between a big army following this uh, general or this you know, military leader. I kind of saw the whole rave scene as that. You've got this crowd of people. They're all going like this, and they're following this guy, and he's basically yelling orders at them. And I thought, this is so funny. It's kind of like this big fucking army that's following them in, into battle. And so I started making uh, the beginning of Tsunami, which is dun, 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 dun. Okay? And then it gets to the drop, and it's got this big kind of German uh, marching uh, thing. Actually, before we call this Tsunami, it used to say, this is Sparta! And then it dropped into it, but because of copyright, uh, it's now called Tsunami. Uh, but that was the symmetry that I was able to see in that case. And I really encourage you guys to see the symmetry all around you of what people are doing uh, and, and how it, when you kind of... Uh, when you kind of get rid of all of the superficialness of it, okay, they're at a rave, they're plurative, but there's something kind of deeper to it, and you can start connecting these deeper dots. Well, maybe I could reimagine them as uh, being this army. Does that make sense, kind of? Yeah, okay, all right, thank you. All right, things that'll help you as an artist. It can be really hard to understand yourself, right? We all often have an inflated uh, imagination about who we are and how cool we are that, you know, it's usually wrong. So play your music for your friends, okay? It will really boost your confidence. Or it'll hurt your confidence if you need a little kick in the ass. Uh, but it will boost your confidence when you find that you're onto something. What makes you special will come to light by listening to their feedback. The universe has this way of letting you know when you're doing what it wants, and you gotta listen. You gotta try a lot of things, and just like me with that song G6, which I probably would have ruined if it wasn't for some of the people in the room, keep trying things, make mistakes, and when you're making that mistake and just about to fix it, it might just make you a millionaire if someone is there to stop and tell you, no, that actually sounds good. Don't fix it. Producers, we always want to fix everything. If it's, if it's wrong, we want to fix it. You know? Sometimes wrong is right. If someone says they have a formula for hits, total bullshit. Trust me. Every time I thought I was making the biggest hit, it fell right on its ass. And, and uh, the times that I didn't think anything of it, they ended up being big. I mean, Tsunami, uh, yeah, G6. Uh, just keep making songs. Don't try to be this genius who knows the formula for making hits. You'll make a fool of yourself. So you will also, this is another thing, kind of going back to the marshmallow thing. You will also see other artists get big and not understand why. The scene might be changing. You don't exactly like where it's going. That's okay. And don't worry about that. Uh, seek to understand yourself and to better communicate yourself and your music. Your fans will come. Uh, if you're meant to have 10,000 fans, 100,000 fans, or a million fans, just be yourself and you'll get the fans you deserve. We're not all meant to have a billion fans. You know, just focus on your own thing. I think it was Jimmy Iovine in that uh, the Defiant Ones who said, you know why they put the helmet on the horses when they race so they don't get distracted by what the other horse is doing? It's really important. You get that metaphor? Okay, cool. Thank you. I got one guy who's really holding it down. Um, okay, the things that will help you as an artist, part two. This goes for all of us loner producers out there, vocals. Try making songs with original vocals as soon as possible. Reach out to songwriters and vocalists 
many of them need you too just as much. There's so many great songs out there being written by people and so many producers that are lonely in their bedroom that could make a smash hit out of it. Collaboration is so key and it makes your life so much easier. It's so much easier for me to get songs done when I'm bouncing off of other people. And when you have a good vocalist, it's like, it's every producer's dream to have a great vocalist on their song. You know, they just make it better, especially female vocalists, I'm a big fan. All right, things that will help you as an artist part two. Study, chords are free to steal. Go on Hook Theory. You guys know what hooktheory.com is? Hook Theory is great because it tells you the most important thing about a song, the melody and the chords that are underneath it. In a simple way that you can understand, it looks like it's designed for little kids. It's perfect. I stole the chords of uh, Secrets from uh, Hedzel Roll. Um, but you know what? You can't copyright chords, so fuck you guys. Um, it, imitating uh, is okay at first. I started out imitating a lot. I don't think that's a terrible thing at first. I love Dr. Dre. I love Timbaland. I just wanted to sound like those guys, you know? That's okay. Style and confidence grow with every little thing you learn and adopt. Um, at the end of it, it's not going to be about if you use cashmere samples. I hear people say, oh, I'll never be original if you use cashmere samples. Don't listen to those guys. Buy more samples. Um, uh, that's really not it. You, you're going to develop a style that's going to be the result of a thousand decisions that you make by the end of a song. So as you get better and better as a producer, this whole idea of finding your sound, it's on one hand, it's intellectual and you can think about it, but on the other hand, with time, the decisions you make will really create your sound. You just gotta keep creating. By the end of a song, it's not about if you use the cashmere kick or whatever kick. It's going to be a combination of 1,500 decisions that you made. So just keep producing, uh, and the decisions that you make will evolve, and you will come up with your style. I, I have no doubt. Also, try getting templates for your DAW and studying. I still download templates for Ableton. I'll open them up. I see how people made stuff. I'm not too big for it. You're definitely not too big for it. Okay, check out the remakes people put on YouTube. That's the same thing. If you like a song that's out and you want to know how it got made, go on YouTube and just check out uh, how it got made. Some kid probably did a version that sounds just as good. And you should, uh, and you're not too big to, to uh, check out. Well, should I talk about mixing stuff? That's eh, kind of boring, right? Does anyone want to hear about? Oh, you want to hear? God damn it. Uh, <laughs> All right, so song structure. Um, so this kind of goes into mixing a little bit. The one, uh, or there's a few things that you should be really cognizant of. And this, this is sort of mixing with a big song in mind, with a complete song in mind. You've got these tools for development. You've got high frequencies. You've got low frequencies. You got the chords you're already using. You got the chords you're gonna introduce. And you got how quickly those chords are moving. Are they gonna go da 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 da? Are they gonna go da da? These are really the basics of uh, development in your song. Don't give away any of them too quickly. When you make a song, nobody A and B's it with another song like you do, like we all do. We put our song next to another song. We think, oh, our song's not loud enough. Nobody listens to music that way. You can create all the rules of your song at the very beginning. What I mean by that is, if you don't have high frequencies, you don't have ultra low frequencies in the beginning, then you have so much room to grow. You've created the world, all that the listener knows at the beginning of the song. And if you limit what they start out with, you have so many places that you can go. So removing and adding high frequencies or bass or new chords, these are all things at your disposal which allow for development. So don't give any of them away too quickly. If you ever listen to guys like Max Martin or Dr. Luke or the kings are making pop music, they always start out very minimally. Uh, what was that Ed Sheeran song, um, The Shape of You? Yeah, it's incredibly minimal. And every little thing they add matters. So that's important. Okay, uh, so mixing now. I've created another little uh, Photoshop guy. Okay, so 
Damn it, I can't. Uh, my finger's not big enough. I was, I was, I'm supposed to cover this. Uh, so, okay. Anyway, thinking, think of mixing as is painting on a finite canvas. Nobody A and Bs your music with other tracks. You create the reference for it. When you think of this canvas, think of this as sort of the uh, ceiling that you have. None of us can pass zero decibels, right? No one can pass your decibels, right? That's where you peak. But still, some songs sound louder than other songs. And that is about maximizing your canvas. You can make things sound really big by the other things that are adjacent to it. Now, something that might be really big is your kick in dance music. And this kick could be the mountain that you have here in the middle. If you notice on the y-axis, that's frequencies. So your kick is taking up a lot of these low frequencies. It's fairly centered. Well, probably should be more centered. Uh, and then the things that push it to the back or in the front are volume and reverb, right? But the other things that can push it to the back are this guy here, for instance. Now, this could have been a big mountain when you look at the birds. But when that guy sits on it, it looks like a big heap of trash, right? He messes up the whole perspective. Without that guy, it's this big, beautiful mountain. But because you haven't prioritized correctly, now your kick seems smaller. Everything is relative. Those little birds, which you can imagine, are sort of the little accents or the synths maybe that are going around your kick that are properly positioned on the side. They're in the higher frequencies. Once you get those out of the way of the kick, you have a big, complete picture. But if you try to put things too close to your kick, just using the kick specifically right now, that go over the kick, well, then you have a problem in that everything starts to seem smaller. One of the things that works so well about Big Room is there's only like two or three instruments. Uh, so they always sounded really, really big, right? Uh, and that's the problem that we get into as songs get more complicated. You're not just going to have birds and you're not just going to have a guy. You're going to have a sun in the back and clouds and all these things. And the best way to think about it is how you can position them like a canvas to make the most complete picture while still giving everything its space. Now, this is kind of basic. You're probably already familiar with this concept. But just be aware. Reverb, maybe people know this exactly. Reverb pushes things uh, to the back. And also your stereo field is incredibly important. Once you start opening your stereo field, it's amazing how much louder you can get. Our ears luckily get tricked by this psychoacoustic effect where when one thing uh, comes out of both speakers at the same time, uh, it sounds like it's in the center. So you have a third speaker that's invisible. Are you guys familiar with that concept? So you have this invisible third speaker, and the beauty of that is you can put a kick super loud in the middle, and you can still have shit that's super loud on the sides. Now, there's another kind of hidden access here. What do you think that hidden access is? Time. Yes, time. So not only do you have the X, Y, and the Z, but this also evolves over time. So how can you create space in your mix using time? Okay, that's actually a good answer too. But I was thinking sidechain. Sidechain allows you to create space where there would be a kick right there in the same place. There is later going to be a bass, and these two things can have a relationship. Now, sidechain is mostly used for kick in the bass. But as a little side, I would recommend you guys track out, uh, check out some plugins like TrackSpacer. Are you anybody familiar with this? So this is something that in real time, it changes the EQ on something when another instrument comes in. So you sidechain one instrument that's important to you, and you tell the other instruments to create the space in their EQ whenever it plays. Now to your ear, you don't hear this big vacancy in the other instruments. You only hear that your priority instrument is always clear. So that's another way that over time you can carve out frequencies and always give things their space. It's called track spacer. Okay, now basic advice. Are we done with mixing? Anybody have any geeky mixing requests that I'm not going to answer? Basic advice. Fuck, fuck the perfect sound. I have friends who sound design well, and they can't make a song. Sounds are like words. They're not poetry until a human comes and puts them together. So don't worry about the perfect sound. Make a good song. And don't even try to make a perfect song. Just make a good song 
that accomplishes one thing right, that sends one message, that offers something cool about your brain, that you combined, I don't know, Native American sounds with Japanese sounds or whatever is cool to you, it had one thing to do and it did it right. You'd be surprised how hard that is. Keep it simple. A lot of sounds have a cool character and are interesting. They just get very uninteresting when you crowd them. So enhance them with layers that avoid the frequency range that make your lead special. Now this applies more conceptually to your song. Your idea that you start out with, how often do we have a good idea and we're like, man, if we could just keep it this good for a whole song, this would be a hit, but it's impossible. Yeah, a lot, right? Yeah, you get stuck in like the four eight bar loop thing. Just keep that good idea alive and map it out and don't get bored of it. <laughs> That's another thing is, um, I'm gonna get to that in a second. Uh, samples and presets, yeah, it's okay to use samples and presets. I make samples and presets, so fucking go use them. Go easy on your brain, okay? And this is uh, what I was gonna talk about, about mapping it out and uh, taking ideas and not messing them up, right? Once a track uh, project is full of tracks, your brain goes into a different space. It's not creative anymore. You're now solving a Rubik's Cube. You got 100 tracks, you're doing a math equation now. Uh, that's why we love restarting and working on something new instead of finishing the songs that we should uh, because we're not in a fun, creative space anymore. But uh, your brain, being this uh, stupid you know, muscle that it is, you can kind of trick it into doing what you want. Try separating sections of your track into different projects so that your brain can always, as much as you can, be in the same mental state that it was when you started working on a song because you were creative back then. And songs become nightmares and you stop wanting to open them up. So you gotta work with your brain. You're, it's kind of like you and your brain are two separate things. And you gotta give it the caffeine it needs. Okay, brain's working a little better. Now we're gonna make the song less complicated. Okay, brain's working a little better. You gotta whip that brain, man. The brain is, it's a jerk. It's lazy, it doesn't wanna get up, it doesn't wanna do the work. I'm constantly in a battle with, uh, with my brain. So I find these little tricks that kind of like I set up a cage and I've trapped my brain in it, you know, to get the song made. And uh, often that is just about simplifying. So when you've got a good idea to start with, really try to keep it simple and map it out quickly and keep the creative part alive uh, for about, you know, the three hours that you've got before it all starts sounding the same to you. I can't stress how important that is. Like 95% of the songs that I make are just like mixing and it's like almost not even creative. There's some creativity in there, but it's just about keeping the first 5% alive and not messing it up once I have a good idea. So that's what I recommend. Also make bounces of all the new things that you try. So you can quickly hear your past ideas instead of opening up the project. There's like a mental block about opening up an old project. Ah, oh, some plugins are gonna be missing or whatever. It just seems like a pain in the ass. Just make bounces always. It's crazy, like the song Power I did with Hardwell. I had a bounce of it, about the, of the vocal idea and stuff. And then I'm just on iTunes and it pops up. And then every once in a while I'd see it and it pops up. And then eventually I'm like, man, maybe somebody else could help me finish this. And then I hit up uh, Hardwell and it turned into power. Uh, so, so kind of acknowledge that you've made a lot of good ideas and they shouldn't all go to waste. So try to make it easy, again, for your brain later to just really quickly click on it and hear. Because in a year, you might hear some magic in something that you made today that you just couldn't see today. Maybe you worked on it for 18 hours and it sounded like rubbish to you. But in a year, you could see it for the genius that it was. So make bounces at everything. And now I'm out. I didn't end on a very interesting note that I, it's not a very powerful note. But go easy on your brain. Now I guess I could feel some questions and I could even pull up a, a project if I brought my Nexus key, I gotta check. You guys hate those Nexus keys, right? They're the worst. What about questions? Hey, uh, I'm Ronnie from San Francisco. Oh, cool, I'm yeah. from Berkeley, California, yeah. man. Um, my question was, when you're at home creating music and yeah. you don't have a vocalist, do you ever like pull out a mic and just start like singing to try to construct music? Yeah, uh, not often, because I really am not good at singing. I had a dream the other day that I could sing, and it was so great. Because <laughs> if you can sing even a little bit, you should really do that all the time. 
because I can. It's like, I even pull myself up on Melodyne, and Melodyne's confused. It doesn't even know what to do with me. Yeah. Huh? Um, but yeah, but that's great. I'm assuming you could sing a little bit. No. Yeah. But, um, you know, a lot of those uh, older cataract songs I would sing into auto tune and um, did a song called Backseat, uh, kind of singing into it. I wrote a song for Sean Paul called The Other Side of Love. Uh, I sang that one. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, there were times where I just really felt like I had to sing a song. And, and I did. Yeah. That's the thing is that if you're a producer, you really need to be a songwriter as well. Um, at least you need to be able to help edit. Uh, when you work with a songwriter, you have to be able to steer them in the direction of good ideas and away from bad ideas. And over time, you start to understand which ideas are going to be corny and they're not a path worth uh, pursuing. Um, so you kind of have to be a good songwriter, even if you're not a good singer. Uh, or else you just get left with crappy songs and you'd be like, what happened? You know, because you didn't really, you didn't mold it in the right way. That's another thing about being a producer. And I mentioned working with vocalists. It was really hard for me to find my voice early on of how to be critical and steer someone away from bad ideas and not sound like an asshole um, and not ruin the vibe. Because, you know... Singers can get really offended, and you got to find a way to gently steer them in the direction of a, a better song. If you see them writing a song about putting their hands up in the air and being very stupid, too. yeah. All right, go on. Next question. Yeah. Hi, now. Uh, first of all, thank you for doing this and sharing your experience. Sure. Um, I'd like to ask you, how, when you're working on an idea, how do you figure out when you're stuck at a certain point? on the track, how do you figure out uh, which elements you're going to introduce, which instruments somehow, whether it's a duduk or another instrument, for instance, for the Dharma break? Yeah, for, uh, for the Dharma break, yeah. Um, well, that, in the case of Dharma, um, we started out with that melody, and it was all about just creating instruments that worked in that world. So I probably, I... I think I did a shootout where I tried maybe a violin doing it and then a duduk doing it and a flute doing it or something. And then I would just sort of compare them all. And generally, you want one thing to be the leading sound. So just trust your gut in that case and um, do a shootout, though. Like when I say keep it simple, I also tried 10 things, <laughs> you know, and then I pick the one that I think uh, works the best. I'm one of those people who always has to try every option before it's okay with me, or I'll never, I'll never forget it. I'll never forget there could have been another option. Okay, we got time for one last question. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, first off, thanks for the relatable uh, session. Thanks, man. My name is Jack from Nairobi, Kenya. Oh shit! What's up, man? Yeah, yeah. And um, I wanted to ask about social media and how. Yeah. I mean, what comes first? How do you balance getting a good following so that you can do more gigs? and focusing on the music. And number two, I have an album out. How would I get you to remix uh, one of the tracks? <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> um, How much budget do you have? <laughs> yeah, the last thing you said made me forget all the other things you said. <laughs> um, <laughs> next question. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, social media. Um, so social media... It's a pain in the ass, but it's very necessary. Now, you mentioned how do you do it to get more gigs. Now, I always tell people when they're thinking about becoming a DJ, don't worry about being a DJ. Just make music. Focus on being a producer. All the time you spend being a DJ now, for me, takes away all the time I want to be making music. And for the first year, I didn't show my face, which meant I wasn't playing any shows. All I did was make a ton of music. And that was incredibly successful for me. By the time that I went out to play shows, I was playing mostly my own songs. Um, now, social media was a big component, and I used to be able to be a lot more active on social media. And especially in the beginning, not showing my face, it was really about this world and creating a world through social media that paired with the songs to create this kind of overall Kashmir vision, which was really not about me at all. It was really about, you know, this world that I wanted to illustrate. Um, now, uh, managing the time with social media, and so, I mean, I think, honestly, a good strategy at first is just make music all day and do social media all night. I mean, that, that's what works for me. Every night I'd be on Photoshop, as you can see. 
you know. Um, and I just create new images and stuff to uh, to post on uh, the Cashmere socials. And um, and then all day I'd be working on songs, and I'd work through the weekend. And um, yeah, and now I'm in this life where I where, where I tour a lot, and I try to manage everything, but it's tough, and I need to get help, and it's just tough to keep it up. So I would just not rush into doing shows, or even look at social media as a way to get more shows. Everyone's path's different, though. I don't know. But for me, I really felt like just focus on the music and the brand. And then once you're at this crazy buzz, then go and play the shows. That That's... Uh, but also, you, may, you, you might have bills to pay, though. So, fuck. I don't know. You know? Uh, but, yeah, about remixing your song. Shit, man. Yeah, if it's real good. If it's real good. I mean, I'll listen to it. Uh, Ooh. Okay. Oh, fuck, man. <laughs> fuck. He got me. He got me. I All think, right. I think we could go on for hours and hours. Yeah, just, yeah. Wow, this is very inspiring uh, Thanks, session. man. Thank thanks, you so man. much for being here yeah. with us today. Um, besides Spinning Academy, again, thank you for having me. Uh, yeah. Being here. Ladies Shit. and gentlemen, the one and only Mr. Cashmere. <laughs> <laughs>